So we're in the Azarian McCullough Art Gallery at, on the campus of St. Thomas Aquinas College, Sparkville, New York. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Carl Ratner. I'm a retired art professor. Uh, we're in the Azarian McCullough Art Gallery looking at the work of Sister Del Myers, and uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to be giving a, a talk about her work and her life. Thanks for coming. Okay, so our dear friend, Sister Adele Myers, passed away almost a year ago on November 7th, 2015. She's survived by her nieces, nephews, grandnieces, and grandnephews, uh, many of whom appear in this uh, family portrait taken in 2006. She will certainly be missed by her family, her Dominican sisters, by many friends, and these include her students, her faculty colleagues, the many artists whose creative efforts she encouraged over the years as an arts advocate and gallery director. Adele's life intersected with many, and many bonded with her into a lifelong friendship. She and I first met almost 50 years ago. It was my job interview, and back then she was Sister Anne Edward, and she was still wearing the habit, and this made me a bit nervous. <laughs> I, was, I was probably thinking of my recent Peace Corps experience in Ecuador, and nuns there were treated with a great deal of deference and addressed as madre, mother, even though many of them seemed barely out of high school. I soon discovered, though, that Adele's measured exterior masked a quiet sense of humor. She was very intelligent, very much aware of the world around her, very spirited, and she wanted to get things done. She explained to me in this interview that in spite of the challenges that would be faced in building this new art program, she was excited by the prospect, she had faith in its outcome, and would I be interested in joining this effort? And of course, how could you say no to this lady? <laughs> and I had the good fortune of becoming her colleague and her friend for the next 46 years. Adele left an indelible mark on me and I suspect on most whom she met in the course of her life. She was just a fascinating person, uh, someone creative and compassionate, someone oddly wise and youthful at the same time, just the sort of person in whose company you'd like to, you delight. And I kind of think that I always felt that she was my big sister. I'm back in Adele's studio after a two months hiatus. Things have been moved around. <laughs> and it seems as if some of the works have been removed for storage. Eventually, everything will be gone, as this room is slated to be an office space. I have fond memories of this place. In years past, I would bring my Art 290 students here so Adele could tell us about her work. She would show us her drawings that had inspired her sculptural forms and her process of tracing patterns onto styrofoam, then cutting out these shapes with a jigsaw. She would then cover these shapes with a nylon mesh, just as one might make a surfboard. The mesh, mesh surface could receive various treatments. If the work was small, a coat of acrylic paint could be applied, and when it got tacky, it was sprinkled with sand. And this provided a tooth for a layer of cement, which could be textured in various ways. If colored sections were to be developed, a layer of lime and fine sand provided the proper surface for a miniature fresco. There were all sorts of items in her studio. <laughs> <laughs> Heavens, styrofoam, palette knives, brushes and color samples, studies for works to be done, and, and boxes of completed works, and loads of inspirational items, rocks, pieces of wood, books and magazine, her bulletin board, which was filled with all sorts of items, and a Renaissance reproduction that I knew to be her favorite, Fra Angelico's Annunciation. I later discovered that this was only the tip of the iceberg. It seemed as if Adele never threw anything away. <laughs> all of these items invariably produced many uh, questions, prompted many questions for my students, like, how long does it take you to make a work? Or, where do you exhibit your work? Or, how much do these cost? <laughs> but the question that always int intrigued me had to do with meaning. What does it mean? And if that question was not asked, 
I would ask something to that effect. I would, might say, Adele, you are a Dominican sister and an artist, and I suspect that many of us can make a connection between these works with their recognizable imagery and your religious vocation, and these works, which, while abstractions, have recognizable elements and titles that prompt meaning. But what about these? These works seem to be about color or texture. They have no title or one that is obscure. They don't seem to make any reference to our everyday world. Are they just form studies? Or do they hold some sort of spiritual meaning, like your other works? Adele would usually go silent for a moment, and then she would always deflect the question by saying something like, well, what do these works mean for you? <laughs> I'm going to come back to the subject of meaning shortly. Suffice it to say for now that contemporary aesthetic thinking usually subscribes to Beardsley's notion of the intentional fallacy, which argues that the design or intention of the author is neither available nor desirable as a standard for judging the success of a work of art. The intentional fallacy argues that meaning in art is problematic, given that art forms once created have a life of their own, and as such are open to interpretation. Artists understand this and they do not want to foreclose on the potential of meaning for their viewers. Hence Adele's comeback, well, what does it mean for you? The intentional fallacy also suggests that because an art form can distill a life's experience, it is layered and complicated, and as such, its meaning may be as elusive to the artist as it is to his or her audience. Well, all this being said, we still want to know more about meaning. George P. Stein, in his, world, his book, The Ways of Meaning in the Arts, offers us some answers. Rather than asking the question, what does an artwork mean, he asks the question, how does an artwork mean? And he comes up with four possibilities. He says that artworks can display one or more of four ways of meaning. Relational meaning, referential meaning, interpretive meaning, and contextual meaning. Relational meaning is how an artwork makes us feel, or not. For example, in this portrait by Adele, if it reminds us of someone we know, her face may evoke some sort of feeling in us. Referential meaning is operative when the work is about something recognizable. In other words, it has a referent. So these two works by Adele, while untitled, display referential meaning insofar as we basically understand what we're looking at. This work, this work, however, is untitled. It does not have an apparent referent. Untitled, it seems to be a pure design, a study of shape, dimension, and color. Interpretive meaning, according to Stein, is meaning that is revealed in terms of some theory or body of knowledge, in terms of. For example, this work by Adele has no apparent referent until we read its title. And we are perhaps reminded of the biblical story and the popular musical it inspired. So with some understanding of that story, and in terms of our understanding of abstraction as reality reduced to an essence, in this case, Joseph's coat reduced to a patch of color, we come to understand its meaning. Contextual meaning suggests that we come to understand things in context. In, in language, for example, context refers to the text that surrounds a particular word or passage and contributes to its meaning. Without proper context, a word or a statement can be ambiguous. For example, this statement, I saw her duck. Well, it can mean any number of things. <laughs> Additional information, however, provides proper context and allows us to arrive at the intended meaning. Many of Adele's non-objective works, which is to say works that have no apparent referent, are obscure to us because they lack context. Titles, of course, help, but most of the time they do not look like anything that we readily recognize. What we need is additional information that will allow contextual meaning to unfold. And from Adele's writings that provide some context, we know a number of things. We know that she was interested in textures that she'd seen in medieval and Gothic buildings. Here's Adele at Notre Dame. 
and she was interested in the color, colorful fresco paintings she had seen in Italy. We also know that she was aware of and interested in the power of artistic contrast, this idea of juxtaposing disparate qualities to create visual tension and interest. Such interest, no doubt, informed the placement of her delicate frescoes on these roughly textured backgrounds. So were these works just a celebration of artistic form? Maybe yes, maybe no. One could speculate that such contrasts could reflect two sides of her personality that are also suggested in her writings, which again provide us with some contextual meaning. Two sides, that part that was gentle, modest, and contemplative, perhaps reflective of her religious vocation, and that part that was assertive, hoping to break, break through from past conventions so that she could discover and share her unique talents. To further speculate contextual meaning, we may note that while many of Adele's individual works lacked titles, there was an entire series that she titled Written in Stone. And these works remind us of ancient petroglyphs written in stone, similarly, but thousands of years ago. Like Adele's works, the petroglyphs remind us of a human presence, the idea that a thinking and a feeling individual, however humble, was here and chose to leave his or her mark for all of posterity. Anna Utilia Anna Clara Myers, Adele to many of us, was born in Brooklyn on October 4, 1925 to Everett and Anna. Everett was a fireman and Anna was a housewife and a mother to Adele and her sister Virginia. The family lived in Sheepshead Bay and later moved to Long Island. Adele's interest in art apparently began at an early age. At a dinner honoring her service to St. Thomas Aquinas College, she told us, I think that my career in the arts started when I was four or five years old. I drew on an ice cream cone and then put a big cherry on top. I thought it was a fine work, but my parents thought otherwise since I had drawn it on the wallpaper <laughs> in the living room. <laughs> Adele grew up in Laurelton, New York, and attended St. Mary Magdalene School in Springfield Gardens, where a sister, Joseph Marine, encouraged her artwork. Sister Joseph was a Spark Hill Dominican and would later be Adele's sponsor. Photos and correspondence indicate that this was a very loving family and that Adele and Virginia were very close and would remain so throughout their lives. Some of Adele's drawings from those years survive. They are signed and dated from 1933 to 1937. Adele attended Bishop McDonald High School and she graduated in 1944. A section of the yearbook indicates Adele's, Adele as Bishop McDonald's best student artist from 1944 and winner of four citations on the honor roll. That spring, she wrote her letter of application to the Spark Hill Dominicans and in the fall of 1944, she entered the order as a postulant, taking the name Sister Anne Edward after mom, Anna and Dad Everett. Here she is with the family. She was 19 years old. And here she is in 1945 with Sister Joseph Marine, and here as Sister Anne Edward, a year later, still working at Cardinal McCluskey's home at her first mission. She was 21 years old. In an entry in her religious diary of that year, and I should say here that that entry is prefaced with the, word, with the, the, uh, the title, The Bells of St. Mary's. And that was, refer uh, was, referring, excuse me, was referring a wonderful movie that many of you are probably familiar with, with Ingrid Bergman and Bing Crosby. And if you, if you remember that film um, and remember that Adele at this time is 21 years old, you'll probably, the, her, her entry in the diary will probably make, make sense. The religious life is so beautiful. I can make it or break it. Oh God, make me a good religious. Help me to do things for others. Give me a great love for children, a burning desire to bring them to you. What a beautiful thing obedience is. Dear Jesus, though I be fighting inside, give me the grace to smile and obey perfectly. 
Help me to want what you want. Make me love you more and more. 30 years later, as suggested in her sabbatical diary, Adele would ponder such traditional notions of obedience to the extent that they might, they just might conflict with her search for an artistic voice. Contributing factors in the 1970s would have been the transformative ideas of Vatican II, the feminist movement, and the personal insights she gained during her sabbatical leave. One of these, which I will mention shortly, was what she called the paradox of religious life. All this being said, there is absolutely nothing in all of Adele's writings that suggests any loss of faith or love for the church and for her Dominican sisters. Adele professed her first vows in 1946 and her final vows in 1951 at the age of 26. When she became a sparkle Dominican, she entered the order with a group of women who over the years referred to themselves as the 11 who entered, the 11 who professed, and the 11 who stayed. Sounds like it could be a good book. <laughs> The Sparkle Dominicans are engaged in ministries devoted to the enablement of the poor, the powerless, the oppressed, and the spiritually deprived. Their good works are performed in missions, senior citizen housing, hospitals, shelters, and formerly in schools, one being this very institution that they founded 60 years ago. While they are no longer at stack, their spirit of professionalism and caring lives on, and it can be seen any day in the work of our very gifted and caring faculty. To perform such professional services requires rigorous training. Adele's began at Fordham University, where in 1956 she earned a BS in education. In 1961, she earned an MA in painting from Villa Schifanoia in Italy. Here she is in that picture. Postgraduate work was done at Notre Dame under the famous sculptor Ivan Mitrovic. Works from these years, a number of which are in this exhibit, reflect her classic training in figure and portrait drawing and, of course, in painting. Those are the ones that are in this exhibit. So several of these paintings are in this exhibit and can be described stylistically as post-impressionistic and are somewhat reminiscent of works by Cezanne. And while they may have been student assignments, they were accomplished and assured. That they often depicted religious subject matter, saints and nuns, was no doubt appreciated by her Spark Hill community back in the 1960s. This would be less the case years later when Adele's work began to evolve into what we now recognize as her signature style. And Adele in the 1970s would be a bit troubled writing that most of the sisters can't relate to my works because they are abstract. Well, this is what's to be expected. Abstraction can be tricky. Such works are meant to function like vi visual abbreviations, to simplify, often to flatten reality, reducing it to an essence. In some cases, the abstraction is fairly recognizable, and a title, when available, helps to confirm the source of inspiration. In other cases, however, we may have difficulty understanding what we're looking at. A case in point may be Adele's work entitled Homage to Anna, which appears as an odd window through which we see sky and clouds, or perhaps these graceful shapes rendered in gentle blues and white are ascending. Either interpretation can work when we know that Anna was Adele's beloved mother. The fact that one of her abstractions, Gaia, occupies a place of prominence in the Spark Hill Convent today suggests how far we have all come to better understand her work. Back in 1961, of course, Adele couldn't probably begin to imagine what she would be doing 20 years later. In that year, fresh out of graduate school, she was an accomplished painter, working in a style that, while somewhat derivative, was popular, appreciated, and potentially marketable. One could speculate that she might have continued to paint that way for the rest of her life, but things were to change. In 1961, she was given a new assignment by her community, 
She was to become a teacher administrator at St. Thomas Aquinas College with all the responsibilities of developing a degree program, scheduling classes, planning a budget, hiring a faculty, attending innumerable meetings, and along the way, being a house mother to a group of very dear but <laughs> mischievous girls, two of which are in the room today under their own recognizance, who periodically left the large statue of the Virgin Mary in her bedroom. <laughs> Adele's new responsibilities at the college took up all of her time and energy for the next decade. In fact, of the 200 plus works that are thus far cataloged, very few date from that period. Indeed, when Adele was finally granted a sabbatical leave in 1973, she would record in her diary, I feel like I'm just beginning as far as, my, as far as my work goes, and now I feel I've found something I want to pursue. It seems to have taken a long time to overcome 12 years of relative artistic inactivity. Granted a sabbatical leave, Adele moved up to Cornwall, New York, to live at the Grail, a retreat center run by an international women's movement. There in a small house, she set up her living quarters and a studio. She created a schedule, finding that she worked best in the mornings when she would do her artwork, shop, thinking, and writing, and the afternoons were left for shopping and housework. And she kept a diary. The diary would document her break from academ academic responsibilities, this opportunity to renew and refresh studio skills, and possibly to further define her artistic voice. But it would also document the challenges she would face, as success, especially in the beginning, was not guaranteed. In retrospect, of course, we know that that sabbatical leave turned out to be a very productive year. Diary entries indicate that she prayed, meditated, listened to good music, and read extensively. She also went to museums, galleries, and the theater, attended lectures, workshops, and retreats, and of course, she worked in her studio. Her diary entries were all beautifully written and fascinating insofar as they reflected her artistic growth and her eventual breakthrough into a new way of working. I'd like to read a few of these entries. The blue text is mine, the words are Adele's. This was her first entry. When they, excuse me, Wednesday, 9, 12, 73. Yesterday's thoughts, what am I doing here? Is this some kind of a fantasy trip? I was never that keyed up about painting or creating of any kind before. This year could be a waste. Maybe the whole thing is a mistake. My drawings were bad, very hesitant, weak. I can feel my absence. As I drew tonight, I thought back to the fact that I've had more than a year and a half of life drawing. You'd never have guessed that looking at this work. My only consolation is that looking at the work of others in the class, as bad as my work is, it surpasses what I saw being done by most of the other students. <laughs> Small consolation, but I must be patient and realize that it will take time. I just watched the 10 p.m. news on Channel 5. There's an 83-year-old woman who graduated from high school in 1907, and she enrolled in Baruch College. It's her first experience in college, and she's taking sociology and English. When the interviewer asked her, do you think you can handle it? She replied quickly and firmly, I know I can handle it. Well, this sort of struck me. Why shouldn't I say the same thing with the same conviction? This is my field. I've been working at what I've been trained to do, at what I've been teaching. I know I can handle it. Coraggio. <laughs> Thursday, 9.13, 10.15 a.m. Just finished breakfast. This morning in church, my thoughts ran to honing down, to strip oneself of all that is extraneous. Somehow or another, I feel sort of peaceful. All those extras did not seem to matter. Um, it could be mentioned here that this process of abstraction, the process of abstraction, is the artistic quest for what she called the essentials, something that would later be reflected in her work, uh, such as these two. Adele was reading Chaim Patak's My Name is Asher Lev, who quotes a passage from The Art Spirit by painter Robert Henry. Adele entered this quote into her diary. He should be careful of the influence of those with, with whom he consorts. 
as he runs a great risk in becoming a member of a large society which tends towards the leveling of individuality to a common consent, thus forming and adhering to a creed. Reflecting, reflecting on this passage, Adele writes, this especially makes me stop and wonder how much of my individuality has become part of the common consent, the least common denominator. Religious life is a paradox. It demands or it has demanded for 25 years of my life external sameness, while at the same time urging each of us to rise to the heights of our own potential, which is a very individual thing. Such sentiments seem later to be suggested in this work entitled A Different Way. Note that what, what might well have been the road not taken, but of course we knew that she would take her own road and go a different way. Again, quoting Robert Onry, Adele writes, the artist should have a powerful will. He should be powerfully possessed by one idea. He should be intoxicated by the thing he wants to express. And she commented, commented, I do hope to achieve this kind of intoxication. Without it, I wonder if anything of worth can be achieved. Since last summer, an idea for a painting has lain dormant in, my, in the back of my head, largely because I didn't know how to do it. The idea came from a visit to Storm King Art Center. I was standing outside the front door, looking up at the cement ceiling in the archway. A vine had been torn away, leaving a tracery of thin branches on the cement. I remember thinking that this would make a good painting. I've long had a feeling for the medieval connotations of cement, excuse me, Basic, simple, rich in texture. I guess it reminds me of a monastery or an ancient church. Some of those thoughts, some of those many fascinating structures that I've seen throughout Europe. There's a whole sense of mystery in it. Well, I've recently discovered a mortar mix used in interior decorating. It adheres to any surface, even ceramic tile. Last week, I started to experiment with it on a small scale. By covering masonite and canvas that had already been painted, leaving a patch of color visible. This establishes a fascinating contrast, rough gray texture with a smooth, glossy color. There's a certain bold, swift impact in all of this that I like, as well as the surprise element, as well as the playful quote, damn everything but the circus. It also shows connections, opposing elements working together to produce a whole pleasing thing. Well, at least it's pleasing to me. I want to do more of this. It's the first thing I've done all year that has me truly excited with a strong desire to pursue. There are so many avenues that I can explore with it, and best of all, I want to. So this is her entry of March 4th, 1974, recording essentially what was her breakthrough into the use of a new medium and a new way of working that over the next 20 years would, would, would produce many fine works. Many of us are probably familiar with her studio prayer. Each day in my studio begins with a prayer. I pray as Thomas Burton did for patience and the spiritual strength to avoid cowardly solutions, falsity and insincerity in my work. I embrace the concept of art as a gift that has the power to extend our minds and enrich our souls and counters the image of art as self-centered and obsessed with its own reflection. Those of us who are engaged in such a search know that this quest for artistic goodness is not an easy journey. To be able to create works that have the power to extend our minds and enrich our souls and at the same time avoid insincerity requires a love of art and the creative process, a willingness to explore and learn, and the courage to continue in spite of failure. Somewhat of an inner conviction tempered with humility that who we are and what we do has some merit. Sister Adele Myers, Adele, to those of us who knew her, enriched our lives and left all of us with a wonderful body of work which we can see in, in this exhibit. There are other places to view her work. In our college library, she has her Via uh, Dolorosa. It's in our temporary chapel. Uh, in the Rosary Chapel next door, you can see her reconciliation window. In Thorpe Village, in the meditation room, there are the windows that she designed. 
and uh, in the Dominican convent, another stained glass window she designed, also some mosaics, and a gate that she designed um, that was fabricated by Eric David Laxman, and the photo is by our George Patanovic. So I wish to thank Sister Ursula Joyce and Professor Nina Bellicio for the efforts in putting this exhibit together, and I thank you for your attention today. So let's have a glass of wine. Thank you.